Hey everybody, today we have Dr. Tracy Kotowski from the Inflammation Division and Tracy will be letting us know about colonoscopies in mice. Thank you. No worries. So welcome everyone and I apologise, I have the same cold that most of you probably have so if my voice crackles as we go, I'll just bear with it and I'll try not to sneeze on anyone. What I thought I'd do today, because my lab's relatively new to we hire, is take you through who we are and what we do. Um, I spend a lot of time down on level two, mostly after hours, because it's my quiet, private, safe time. I'm quite good at finding my way around in the dark down there, so just in case you do run into me at night, I thought I'd make sure that you know that we are nice people and you know, we're not doing anything bad. Um, I'll take you through the cancers that we study as well and what we hope to learn from those cancers. So just as a bit of background, I grew up in Canada, so that's why I have a slightly funky accent. I went to the University of Toronto, and that's where I studied how blood vessels and neurons talk. So I spent a lot of time taking brains out of mice. My supervisor was famous for understanding why blood vessels form and the types of proteins that cause those blood vessels to form. Then I had what I refer to as my early life crisis, and I needed to get away from home. Oh, actually, one of the things I should mention is in Canada we say about, not about, just in case you're confused about how we pronounce things. So after my early life crisis, I moved to New Zealand, to Christchurch, and this is what Christchurch looked like before the earthquake knocked everything down, unfortunately. I had um, two supervisors, Juliet Gerard, she's my primary mentor, she's a fantastic woman, she's achieved so much in her career. And I spent the last year of my PhD here at Melbourne Uni in Tony Bassick's lab. He's the director of Bar 21 just down the road. Now I changed fields again after my PhD and a few things drove me to make those decisions. The first is Dan Dumont. My first supervisor was diagnosed with colon cancer. He's still battling colon cancer. The second is my primary supervisor who I've not listed here was Sandra Jackson. She actually passed away during my PhD from colon cancer. Her husband was my co-supervisor. He obviously took quite a bit of time off work. So I started thinking about what I wanted to do with my life. We don't make a lot of money. I can't donate a lot of money to things, but I tend to be quite clever sometimes. So I decided I wanted to work in a field where I could do something that could make a difference. So the other reason I moved to New Zealand, apart from the midlife crisis, is that the Canadian dollar is actually better than the New Zealand dollar. It's probably the only country in the world that the dollar is better than. So it meant that I wasn't a super, super poor student, just a poor student at the time. So I've worked at the Ludwig Institute in Parkville across the road for about 10 years. And one of the things that I try to do as well is promote scientists. We have a difficult career. It's quite difficult for women in science as well. So you'll see my photo on quite a few different things. Um, it's quite humorous for my group because I'm probably one of the shyest, quietest people in the building, yet they tend to have me give a lot of public talks and do a lot of public campaigns here at WeHi. So we joined two years ago. You'll see when the stamp comes out next week, that lovely little person in the corner there is uh, me. So um, buy a stamp, support WeHi, and uh, help us celebrate our centenary. Now, as I mentioned, science is tough for us. You'll hear us grumble a lot about grants and the difficulty in getting funding. And so why do I stick with it when we have a really hard day? This is a photo from my little brother's wedding. This is my little brother here. He's not so little, he's a bit bigger than me. But if you have a look at the photos in the, the people that were at the wedding, this was a wedding a year and a half ago. This is one of my brother's best friends, Becky. She passed away from triple negative breast cancer last year. She was only 28. This is my uncle, Larry. He passed away last Christmas from colon cancer. So cancer's a bad thing. We all know people who have suffered from cancer in this room. When I have a bad day, I look at this picture and these are the people that sort of push me to keep things going. So who's in my lab? So these are the people you'll see crawling around downstairs, probably looking sheepish if they've done something wrong. This is Nya. So Nya is a postdoc with Philippe Boulay and I. Her and I saw in room 15, I think. So a lot of you will be used to talking to us in room 15. This is Adele. She's one of my RAs. She does everything. So you'll know that I rely on Adele quite a bit. She's just back from maternity leave. She does a lot of the endoscopy. So if we ask you to box up mice and leave them in the airlock, it's Adele who's probably going to pick them up. This is Lotta, she's also just come back from maternity leave. She does a lot of our genotyping, so she's only in a couple days a week at the moment. And this is Paul and Ashley. These are the two that would probably look the most sheepish if they've done something wrong. They're both PhD students in the lab. 
Ashley we've adopted from the Ernst Lab and they moved out so they live in Newton John and Paul's been with me for quite a while. And I supervise, co-supervise a number of other students around the building. So many of you know we've been in your mouse rooms setting up different types of experiments. We have a new PhD student starting in August, Suet. She did her honors with us, so some of you may have met her. We have a new postdoc starting in January with the Peter Gibbs lab. Those postdocs are clinicians, so they probably won't be in the animal rooms too much, but when they are, you can remind them that mice aren't quite the same as people. So we're focused on inflammation-associated cancers, and before I introduce you to what that is, I want to focus on the word cancer. So in Australia, unfortunately, we have one of the highest rates of cancer in the world. So half the population is predicted to be diagnosed with cancer and die from the disease. So that's half this room, half our family, half of our friends. Last year, about 130 Australians, 130,000 Australians were diagnosed with cancer. And unfortunately, those that live out in the country or further away from big cities have a poor prognosis because they can't get to the hospitals to get the treatments that they need. So if you are diagnosed with cancer, your chance of living five years after that diagnosis is about 60%, which isn't actually that good. So we're interested in understanding how we can better understand different types of cancers and develop new treatment options for them. So what is an inflammation-associated cancer? Well, cancers are really an age-related disease. Most people that get cancers get them later on in life. And there's two different ways we think about cancers. You can either inherit a mutation, and you'll have heard of different mutations that make you susceptible to cancers. So Angel uh, Angelina Jolie has just emphasized the BRCA2 mutations. So often you inherit a mutation, and different things happen over the course of your life that lead to cancer. So for example, if you have inflammatory bowel disease, you have different insults to your GI tract that might promote colon cancer. The other way that cancers can happen is that you expose yourself to insults. So if you're a smoker, for example, you're exposing your lungs to different insults, <clears throat> you're acquiring mutations, and then you're developing the cancer. So to define an inflammation-associated cancer, it's one chronic inflammation, and I'll explain to you exactly what we mean by chronic inflammation, promotes the onset and progression of cancer. So it doesn't really matter when you inherit that mutation or acquire the mutation, but the cells around the cancer are going to help that cancer to grow. And so the tissue microenvironment, which is what we call the cells that are around the cancer, can determine how your cancer progresses or whether or not those mutated cells just sit dormant. So just because you have a mutation doesn't mean you're going to develop a cancer. Those cells can just sit there for your whole life and not do anything bad. So how do we understand cancers? So you all know that we grow cells in the lab in tissue culture. This is one of the ways we can do things. The first time human cancer cell lines are isolated was in the 1950s. And the advantage to this is that they've been around for a really long time. So we know all the different mutations that the cells might have from the original patient that they came from. We know how to change them. So you've heard about CRISPR, you've heard about us sticking GFP into things so that we can track the cells. We know how to treat them so we can see how many cells live and how many cells die in the presence of different therapies. And we know how to grow them into mice. But one of the things we need to think about is we have to step outside of the box and consider whether or not there's more happening in the cancer. And the main reason is that this is what cell lines look like in culture. So this is all epithelial cells. It's one single type of cell. They're growing as a monolayer on plastic, so it's a flat sheet of cells. But if we look at an actual human colon cancer tumor, you can see there's a number of different types of cells. These big blobby cells are goblet cells that produce mucus. We have immune cells and fibroblast cells and epithelial cells. So that's not really the same as what we're growing in a culture dish. So we can't just treat these cells and then assume that that's going to work in a patient. So it's really important for us to remember that tumor cells don't live in isolation. And that's why a lot of the mouse models we use are so important, because we're looking at all these cells within a living organism, which is as close as we can get to people. So this is a picture of a human biopsy of colon cancer. And as I mentioned, we know that there's different mutations, and we have ways of visualizing those mutations. So you can see here where there's dark brown staining. That's telling us that there's a mutation within one of the worst pathways you could have a mutation in a colon cancer. And so for quite a long time, we focused on those mutations and different drugs that would target those mutations. But what we forgot about is there's other types of cells around those mutated cells. 
And CD3 is just a marker for some of our immune cells. You can see all these brown dots are a specific type of immune cell. So in 2004, a lot of groups in the US started waving their arms in the air and saying, why aren't we looking at these different immune cells? What if they have an important role in cancer? And it was actually quite a long time ago that it was first observed that inflammatory cells have roles in disease. So this gentleman with the shapely beard first realized that infections can lead to an inflammatory response. And he had an arch nemesis, which was this guy, who first realized that inflammatory cells were linked to cancer. So this discovery was made in 1850. Why did it take us until 2004 to start realizing what was going on? And unfortunately, one of the problems is scientists tend to follow trends. If somebody gets excited about something, we all get excited about it and we work on that. But it's really important for some of us, especially the younger generations coming through, to think just a little bit outside of the box. So when we talk about cancers, we talk about hallmarks of cancers. Hallmarks of cancers are the things that help a cancer cell to live. So sustaining proliferation means that the cells can continually divide so that the cancer can grow. Evading growth suppressors means that nothing can stop them from growing. Their ability to invade and metastasize, so a colon cancer usually goes to the liver and to the lungs. They divide forever. They get blood vessels growing in them, and the blood vessels provide the food to them. And they resist cell death, so they're not able to, to, to die. And the two newest hallmarks of cancer that scientists only really started to recognize in 2011 was that the cancer cells avoid immune destruction. So it's our body's job to kill foreign cells, and cancer cells are foreign cells and that tumor-promoting inflammation can also promote cancer growth. So this is really the focus of my lab, and we've really come into this field at the time that it was born, so we're completely on top of what we should be doing at the moment. So I want to introduce you to the gastrointestinal tract, and the colon and intestine is where we spend a lot of our time in. In humans, the colon has a number of different regions, and different types of colon cancers form in different regions. Then your small intestines are all packed in behind it. The mouse is quite similar. The main difference is the colon in the mouse goes straight up to the cecum, and the small intestine is packed all around it. So a lot of what we focus on in the colon cancers we study is this descending sigmoid part of the colon, because that's the bit we can easily see in the mice. Now, what does your colon look like if you look up close? So the small intestine and the colon have a lot of bumpy bits. We call these villi and crypts. The reason it's bumpy is because it increases the surface area of your intestines. So the main job of your intestines is to absorb food and nutrients. If it was all just flat, it would, there wouldn't be very much area for that to happen. So the body has lots of bumps. Then we have these epithelial cells. We have blood vessels, immune cells, and a number of different types of cells. And you can see the structure of the small intestines just a little bit different from the colon. And that's quite important because in people, we don't actually get cancers in the small intestine. We get them in the colon. So how these different cells behave is a little bit different. And if we have a look at what that looks like histologically in the mice, this is the small intestine. These are the villi. These are the crypts. The crypts are the cells that divide. The cell divides to give that cell. And as it continues to divide, it pushes the cells up. Then eventually, they slough off into the lumen. And so every 24 hours, your intestine completely regenerates itself. So that's a lot of stuff happening. One of the reasons that your colon is quite prone to getting cancers is because every 24 hours, if that cell has to divide and push those cells out, lots of things can go wrong. There's lots of opportunities for things to go wrong. So I find that process completely fascinating. It's just one single layer of cells. These cells are a few microns wide. They separate the insides of our intestine from the inside of our body, so they have a really important role. And if something goes wrong, if the patient has inflammatory bowel disease or just an irritant, they had too much of a burnt steak at a barbecue, there's a breakdown in those epithelial cells and all the bugs that are inside our intestine come into contact with all of our immune cells. And this is when chronic inflammation happens. So these immune cells are meant to repair that, it's meant to be a wound healing response. But sometimes, if this goes on for a long time, they get peer pressured by other bad cells, and they start making things that can cause these cells to grow into tumors rather than repairing that hole. And that conversation is what my lab is really interested in. Now, this is an image of a mouse colon with tumors, and the nice pink staining is the mucus layer. 
So the mucus layer is really important because it helps to protect these epithelial cells. And you can see that tumors are quite clever. Where there's a tumor, they've lost the bright pink staining. That means they've lost that protective barrier and they're letting all these nasty bugs come in to interact with our immune system. So it's giving them a way to trigger that bad conversation between these cells to help them to grow. So we want to teach tumors how to behave. We want to make sure that they maintain all the protective things they need so that those cells do what they should do. And so of course, again, this comes back to the point to why we do the research. We're focused on trying to target that conversation between the cells because if we can control that, we can control the way that the tumors grow. So we look at cytokines. Now cytokines are small things that all of the cells in our body can secrete. So if we think about the tumor microenvironment, which has all of our immune cells, they secrete these cytokines, and those cytokines talk to the cancer cells. So cytokines were discovered in the 50s. There are hundreds of them. There's greater than 40 cytokines called interleukins, and so we work on a family of these. So there's about 12 of them that we study in the lab. They have a lot of different functions, and we don't fully understand why we have so many. Why do we need 150 of them, and what exactly do they do? So again, these cytokines are part of this crosstalk between all these different cell types present within the tumor. So I want you to think about a telephone conversation. So the cytokine is like the conversation, the words that you're speaking. That conversation goes down a telephone. So the cytokines have a number of receptors, which is like the telephone receiver. Then that conversation has to get through to other parts of the cell. And sometimes that conversation goes wrong or it's misinterpreted, and that's when cancer cells start to grow. So the other way that you could think about it is like a footy game. So you've got to pass the ball, get it from one end to the other to get your goal. I tend to think of things a little bit differently because I grew up in Canada, so a bit more like a hockey game where people have to keep, or different signals have to keep things in check. And I married a Kiwi, so I also have to think of it this way. So again, we have our signal, we have our receptors in order to get the ball rolling. If anything goes wrong, you don't get the goal, you don't get the right message across. And some of our images have disappeared. So imagine here, there are a bunch of pictures that are brown. So we're interested in the end of the message, which is STAT3. Now STAT3 is a protein that cytokines tell cells to make, and it's involved in all those hallmarks of cancer. So it tells the cells to stay alive, to divide, to grow, and to do all the bad things it should do. And we can visualize STAT3 using a technique called immunohistochemistry, where we stain human tissue, and where you see the brown bits, you can see STAT3. So we can start looking at patients with low STAT3 compared to patients with high STAT3 to try to understand why these different patients have different levels of STAT3. You can see here, these are invading bits of tumor. They have really high STAT3 compared to the growing tumor. So what's happened here? What conversation are they getting that those cells aren't getting? And so we ask a few different questions. Why is STAT3 changed in inflammatory bowel disease patients or colorectal cancer patients? What's telling STAT3 to turn on? And is there a delicate balance between having no STAT3 and having really high STAT3? And so some of the ways we do this is to use a number of animal models. And this is where I want to introduce you to our endoscopy unit. So this lives up on level four. So we have to unpack our mice up from level two, put them on a trolley, take them up to level four, and have a play with them. The mice are in the same, or the system's in the same room as the IVIS unit. So for those of you that have used the IVIS unit, you'll see all of this stuff on the bench. This is a unit we use for light endoscopy, and I'll show you some examples of what light endoscopy is. So there's boxes that have a camera, boxes that have light so that we can see things. We hook it up to a computer so that we can record and monitor our videos. And this is the bit that goes into the mouse. Now we also have a new system, which is a confocal system, which means it shines colors on the mice so that we can see things in different colors. So there's lasers here. It has its own separate monitor so we can see things colored green, colored red, or the green and red at the same time. And we can tee those two systems up together. So this light endoscopy system, we had the second one in Australia originally. In the last month, I've helped set up seven others across Australia, so it's becoming quite a common tool. The main reason is it's really good for the mice, and you'll see what I mean in a moment. This endoscopy system, this is the confocal one. We have the only one in Australia. The system we have at the moment is on loan because we're raising the money for it because it costs 5,000, 500,000 pounds. So it's a million dollar piece of equipment. 
So when you see all these sticky notes up there that say, please don't touch it, please don't put anything on it, it's because I'm terrified of housing a $1 million piece of equipment that we don't actually fully own just yet. So this is the bit that goes into the mice. This is the end that goes into the mice. This is the bit that helps me control the light. So this gray cable goes into this box for the light. It has an air pump that helps me to keep the camera defogged and so that I can see where I'm going. And other bits so I can control the camera. And if I use the two together, this is the camera lens that lets me see the colon normally, and this is the fiber optic end that lets the fluorescent light through. Now, I'm going to show you this video at the end. I wasn't going to, but um, Giovanni's on holiday, so I can embarrass him because he's not here, so we'll come back to that. <laughs> So these are some examples of the videos. This is what a normal healthy colon looks like when we put the endoscope in it. So what we're looking for is the vasculature, so you can see some blood vessels here. Normally we can see through the colon at the other side because it's translucent, like I said, it's really thin. And we can also take biopsy, so this is our biopsy forcea. Now this endoscope was actually originally designed for children to go into their ears, so it's actually a piece of equipment that's used in the clinic. There was a German group who got clever and decided to stick it up a mouse rear. It was a mouse who decided to, to do that. This is a mouse that has colitis. So you can see there were lots of mucus bubbles. You can see the loose stool, so the mouse has diarrhea. We can also score a number of parameters, very similar to how you would do in human disease. So this lets us have a look at what's happening inside the mouse, because even though outside we're weighing the mice, we're doing visual checks, we can't necessarily tell what exactly is going on inside. So it means that we can tell when the mouse is going to get sick and when the mouse may need to go um, without having to put it through some of the physical symptoms that we wait to watch for. These are some examples of tumours. So you can see all of these tumours in the mice. The um, bubbles that you see are the mucus that's being produced. You can see this mouse has quite a large tumour. We can navigate around it. Usually once the tumour blocks the lumen, that mouse wouldn't go on for any further. Again, that's not something you'd see just monitoring weight loss necessarily in the mouse. And this one's just another example that doesn't quite have as significant of a tumor burden. So what we do is we treat the mice with different drugs, so we put different genetic backgrounds through, and we track individual tumors and how they grow or how they respond to drugs. And that's quite powerful as well, because it means that we don't have to kill a cohort of 12 animals just to get statistical significance. We can look at four and track individual tumors over time in the mice. And this is an example of the confocal endoscopy running at the same time. So this is the light endoscope. Then you'll see a pink light come on, which is when I turn on the laser for the confocal endoscope. Then I have to set it right up against the side so that we can see the specific cells. And if we run the confocal video, it will let me. What you can see here are green cells. So we've labeled all the epithelial cells green. If we look at them at the top, we can see their heads. And you'll see as I squish them, you'll start to see their long arms. And these are the villi and crypts that are right here that I was talking about before. And this is just intraepithelial space, so the space that all those immune cells and other cells are sitting in. So the advantage of being able to do this is that we can look at specific reporter mice. So if I want to see which immune cells come to an ulcer during IBD at which stage of the disease, I can see it in real time in live mice rather than killing the mice. The other thing I can do is if I'm not sure if one of my favorite therapies is actually getting to the tumor to treat the tumor, I can stick something on that antibody, say, that glows. Then I can watch the tumor and see if it actually gets into the tumor, how long it stays in the tumor, and if that tracks with the tumor's response to therapy. So they're neat tools and tricks, they're my favorite toys, but they let us see what's happening in a mouse in real time. It's a better way to monitor the health of the mice and it gives us more power in the data we collect to understand what we're doing. Now I just put these images up just in case those videos didn't work. So this is the green mouse that I showed you. These are in Shannon's room. So they have a Cree that drives a YFP allele that makes just their intestines green. So this is those cells that I showed you from the top. This is what it looks like in the histology. These are those crypts that I showed you, and that's what it looks like when they're green. <coughs> um, green. Now we can do other tricks, like check the vasculature and see if the vasculature is leaky or if it's doing what it should do. And to do that, we tail vein inject the mice with something called fitzy dextran. So it's just little beads that glow. 
Then we can look before we inject and after we inject. And here you can see the vasculature in the mice. And you can see all these goobers is the leaky vasculature. So we can quantify the branching, the type of vasculature, and how much it's leaking. And that tells us quite a bit about different things we can do to target different diseases. So I'm just going to show you a wee bit of science science now and how we apply some of these models to what we see. So one of the models that we do quite a bit, and we've got quite a few experiments on at the moment downstairs, is called the colitis associated cancer model. Now the reason that we do this is because patients with ulcerative colitis, depending on how long they've had the disease, how severe the disease is, the types of foods they eat or their genetic mutations, they can become highly susceptible to developing colorectal cancer. So we model this in mice by giving them azoxymethane. So this is a carcinogen that we inject into the mice. Then we provide them with something called dextran sulfate sodium in the drinking water over three cycles. So this causes irritation within the GI tract, kind of like IBD patients would have. We do three cycles because it represents three different flares of the disease. So IBD patients don't suffer from IBD every day, every night. They have flares of the disease and then it goes away and flares of the disease and it comes back. So we can use endoscopy to monitor the tumor burden in these mice. So we know that the tumors generally start to pop up after the second cycle. This is again just an example of what the tumors look like and then we use histology at the terminal endpoint to work out the grade of the tumor and what exactly has happened in the tumors. So if we think about that bad STAT3 allele that I mentioned that can drive tumors, if we have mice that have more STAT3, we get more tumors. If we have mice where we've taken away STAT3, specifically in those epithelial cells, we have no tumors. So this type of data tells us that STAT3 has some sort of role in driving the progression of those tumors. We can also do things like treat the mice with drugs that target STAT3 and track the tumor burden in an individual mouse over time. So each of these boxes is a mouse. This was their tumor burden before we treated them. This is their tumor burden with the drug after we treated them, compared to the mice that didn't get the drug. So this is how we track what's happening in an individual mouse over time. So we also look at sporadic colorectal cancers. So about 20% of colorectal cancers happen because of the mutations that you have. We don't know what triggers it, but we know which mutations can drive the disease. There's a few different genes, one called APC, which is most commonly mutated in colorectal cancer. That happens first. Then you acquire a number of different mutations as your disease progresses. So again, we can model this in the mice by giving them six injections of this carcinogen, one a week, then monitoring their tumor burden over time. And again, there's a number of these experiments on downstairs at the moment. And again, if we take these mice that have lots of that bad STAT3, you can see we get quite bigger bleedy tumors. So the vasculature in tumors is quite leaky because they make it so quickly so that they can grow and survive. Whereas a wild type mouse doesn't have very much happening in tumors. So again, this tells us that STAT3 is really important to drive how tumors grow. Now the other thing that we do, um, and this is partly because after 10 years in the lab I'd like to have my Saturdays and Sundays back and not have to be in to check on the mice all the time. So some things we do genetically. So rather than putting DSS in the water, we use Crees and different alleles to mimic the types of mutations that patients would have. Now this is just an example of a tumor. And we've taken away one of those cytokines I mentioned that we think is involved in that conversation with STAT3 and you can see that no tumors have formed. Now again, these mice are in Shannon's room at the moment, and they have this YFP allele. And what we've done is combined a number of mutations where we can make these tumors start to metastasize. So you can see these are cells from the tumor starting to escape the tumor. And by having this YFP allele, it means that I can find where those cells have gone quite easily. So did they go to the lung? Did they go to the liver? And what changed about them? So I can use fax analysis, which helps us find glowing cells and isolate them to see what's different about the cells that metastasize to the liver compared to those that were originally in the colon. Now that's really important because when people get cancer, they often get their primary tumor, then it metastasizes to a number of different regions. We're really good at treating primary tumors. It's the metastasizing tumors or the secondary tumors that often kill patients because those tumors change. So the drugs that we use to treat the primary tumors are not appropriate for the rest of them. So we really need to understand what changes so that we can start giving patients the appropriate drugs to treat all of the tumors that they have as opposed to just the primary tumor. 
And the other thing that we've been doing that you guys have been a huge help with us for is setting up patient drive sonographs. So you know Claire Scott, Marie Lias, and Kate Sutherland's group do this for ovarian and lung cancers. We've started doing it for colon cancers. So we have the only patient drive sonographs for colon cancer in Australia at the moment. These are in room nine that Christy's been taking care of. What happens is I get a phone call from the Royal Melbourne Hospital that a patient's come out of surgery with a cancer that I can use. I run downstairs in a panic to see who's around so I can cut that tumor up and we stick it into the mice. So we grow the tumors on the flanks of the mice. I prefer to put xenograft tumors on the back flanks of mice because I find the bedding here tends to irritate the tumors and they ulcerate a little bit quicker. So if they're on the back, they tend not to scratch and bother them too much. Then once we have enough of these growing, we can start treating them with drugs so we can see which tumors respond and which tumors don't. Now we get patients at their first diagnosis, which means that when we start doing these types of experiments, the patients are still alive. We can feed this data back to their treating doctor and hopefully that will help with deciding what sorts of treatments they should get. We also move this type of work along so that if this patient responded to the drug, then becomes resistant, we can start understanding why that patient became resistant. So this is an example of one of our PDXs. You can see here sometimes they do ulcerate, that's obviously an endpoint for us. This one grew really quickly in a really long bit. And you can see here that it looks just like a patient tumor does. These are all the different types of cells and we can keep these growing in the mice for quite a long time. Now some of you will know this completely weirded me out when we first started doing this. It was fine to work with mice and give mice tumors, but to keep a patient's tumor alive for as long as we have was slightly strange to me. Um, we've gotten used to it now. And it's going to be quite a powerful tool for us to help understand how patients respond to different drugs. So what I've shown you in the science bit, which hopefully everyone was able to follow, is that cancer cells can acquire mutations. Different signals can come from different cells around them. We focus on the signals called cytokines that have this conversation with the cells to activate STAT3. If we inhibit STAT3 or some of those cytokines in that conversation, we can actually cause the tumor to regress. Then we can start combining these with chemotherapies and things to see if we can actually improve a patient response to drugs. But is it really that simple? Is there just one protein that's involved in things? And does that protein have such an easy on and off role? So I've told you that having lots of STAT3 is bad for colon cancer. Having no STAT3 is bad for those with IBD because they're more likely to have a worse disease. Those patients also develop colon cancer. So what exactly is going on? Now, I don't want you to worry too much about the schematics so much as to know that we like to screw around with things in the lab. This is a type of receptor for how this conversation should happen. So cytokines interact with that telephone. That telephone allows the conversation to happen. Essentially what I've done is changed the phone receptor so that the telephone's on all the time and it doesn't need to have the conversation. And I've made this happen specifically in the epithelial cells. So what it means is I can compare what happens when that conversation's happening in the entire mouse. We have lots of STAT3 to when that conversation's only happening in epithelial cells. It's on all the time and we have lots of STAT3. Now, the first thing I'm going to point out is this is an experiment that was done at the Ludwig where we had slightly different endpoints for weight loss, so nobody needs to panic that we've done anything against ethics here. So while tight mice untreated, this is what the colon looks like. And I've shown a few of you how to take the colon out. We take it right out down to the bum, so we keep a little bit of hair so that we know we're at the bottom, and out to the cecum, and we keep a little bit of the small intestine because we measure the distance between there and there. So a mouse that's gone through DSS that has a lot of inflammation, the colon gets shorter, and that's because of the response the colon's having, the inflammatory cells are being made, and everything sort of constricts to try to fix things. So you can see a lot of type mouse has a nice short colon. During DSS, the mice don't generally lose weight. As soon as we take them off DSS, they do start to lose weight. Now, if we have STAT3 everywhere, you can see this mouse with DSS looks completely fine, doesn't really lose any weight. If we have STAT3 only in epithelial cells, colon looks pretty much fine, doesn't seem to lose any weight. So this tells us that just STAT3 in the epithelial cells is good, and that helps us to avoid a lot of the clinical symptoms of inflammatory bowel disease. So this is what that looks like if we monitor it by endoscopy. So these are our wild-type mice. These are our quite sick diarrhea, i.e. wild-type mice. These are our STAT3 everywhere, and STAT3 just in the epithelial cells. 
Now, if we were to do this experiment the old-fashioned way and just kill mice at different time points, our conclusion would be that these two mice are the same. Having STAT3 in epithelial cells is all you need to avoid this phenotype. But if we look in the same mouse over time using endoscopy, you can see a wild-type mouse still has colitis. So all these bumpy bits are those epithelial cells trying to repair themselves. This mouse with STAT3 everywhere develops tumors. So this is the same mouse with the tumor starting and the tumor growing out. But our mouse that just has epithelial STAT3 doesn't develop any tumors at all. So there's actually something quite unique happening, <clears throat> and the different cell types that get STAT3 are actually quite important. And this is an observation that we wouldn't have made without looking at that same mouse over time. So what it tells us is in the context of STAT3, there's good and bad STAT3. We need STAT3 in those epithelial cells to help maintain that barrier so that those bad bugs stay out there and our immune cells stay in here. In case of inflammatory bowel disease, we know that that barrier can break. So STAT3 helps to protect it. But if we have STAT3 everywhere, STAT3 in these cells and STAT3 in these cells, then lots of conversations go wrong and that provides an opportunity for the cancer to grow. So this is important because if we're going to treat patients with STAT3 inhibitors, we don't want to cause this kind of scenario where we're going to make inflammatory bowel disease worse, but perhaps stop the cancer. And we want to have this scenario where we're going to kill the cancer but not cause any other problems. And so before we put drugs into clinical trials for patients, it's really important we tease out all these different things that can happen. Because if we don't, those drugs go into patients, they fail the clinical trials, and nobody benefits. Our research doesn't go any further, and the drugs don't make it to the patients for the long term. So I just want to stop and thank you guys. My lab is very dependent on you guys. We're very appreciative of all the help. You'll know that when I came over from the Ludwig, it took me a long time to trust again, I think I will say. Um, at the Ludwig, we had to do everything on our own, so we weren't used to having people who were happy to help us. There's a few people that need a little bit of um, special mention. Shannon, because she's taking care of all of our mice at the moment and getting used to all of our phenotypes. Now, I've run around quite a bit for surgeries because I'm not supposed to be on the isoflurane machine very much, even though you will see me on it every now and then. So um, we've had quite a bit of help from everyone, and we have quite a few things that happen in Q1 as well, and I'm quite grateful to those guys. And that's it. If anybody has any questions, I'll load up Giovanni's um, embarrassing video while you think of them. <laughs> You can fire away any questions you would like as well. So the video is from a type of publication that we've just done. So one of the new things for different methods is to publish things as videos. Now, when they came to record the video, and I'm going to go through my embarrassing bits because you don't need to see them. Um, or do you it do turns out that I shake quite a bit when I try to their to inhibit the induced shoulder, so I ran downstairs to get to is administered So the video just outlines the type of techniques this video, that I showed you that. So this is explaining the how this gets injected used. with different therapeutics at different times. Dextran time sulfate so sodium, or DSS, is then administered in the drinking water to elicit acute mucosal damage and many of the histopathological features associated with them goes through how we monitor the mice. You don't need to see that, you don't need to see that. And here is <laughs> of drugs and um, compounds. Again. And this allows us really to test the same mouse. So that's the TS for those of you who have these compounds have an activity. Just eight years before they I'll be demonstrating this procedure with Giovanni. Back to Giovanni. Mm. Yeah, there he is. So everything else that you see coming up, there's Giovanni. On day one, administer the therapeutic of interest and appropriate Shit. vehicle controls. Camera, look how well. In this demonstration, five micrograms She's of recombinant cheap. human interleukin-11 protein was dissolved in 200 microliters of phosphate buffer saline. So you can imagine they had the camera right here where we're trying to inject things. Determine the timing and frequency so of the create <coughs> and weigh of the 
It does. So you'll hear a lot. Um, we talk about personalized medicine. That's because patients have different mutations. So there's thousands of mutations that can occur in a single tumor. When those metastasize, they can accumulate any combination of them. So what has happened classically is patients just get chemotherapy and everybody's treated the same. But that chemotherapy kills your good cells, kills your bad cells. A lot of patients are resistant. So instead of just looking for the mutations and targeting those mutations, we're trying to look at all the other things that happen around. Because the immune cells are something we all have. If we can focus on things like the immune cells, then regardless of the type of mutation you have, hopefully that will treat all of the tumors in your body as opposed to just your primary tumor. But it does mean, and we're very lucky in Australia and very lucky to be attached to the Royal Melbourne and have access to fantastic clinicians, we're really good here about sequencing patients' tumors so that we know what mutations they have, so that we know which drugs not to give them, which doesn't happen every place else in the world. Lots of patients are just given drugs, see what happens. So it's it's good for us. Yeah, absolutely. So that's one of the things that we, we want to do at the moment. It's sort of against what the rest of the scientific community understands because people think of STAT3 as being something bad. And so trying to activate it to protect ulcerative colitis and Crohn's patients kind of goes against what we've been trained. So it takes a little bit to convince people that you need to think, think about things at the stage of the disease and what's actually happening in the disease, rather than just let's stop STAT3 and, and see what happens. So we do two things. We try to stop that conversation for the cancers, but we also try to promote that conversation for the inflammatory bowel disease patients. Because as you saw in the mouse, if it has lots of STAT3 and epithelium and it doesn't get bad disease, it doesn't get cancers. So if we can do that in the patient much before they're at the stage of a cancer, it would be good. Yeah? Um, how often do you do the endoscopy? Yeah, so it depends on the experiment. If we're looking at a acute colitis model, so those eight-day models, we tend to look before we do it so that I know what the mouse looks like before we give it colitis. Then at day three, five, and eight. And the reasons for that is that at day three, it's just when your body starts responding. So we can start to see, does everything look normal or are they starting to get colitis? Day five is when things just start happening. So we can kind of look at the onset of that disease. And day eight, as you saw, is when they start dropping weight and things are really happening. So we can look at the disease. For the tumor models, it depends on what the question is we're going to ask. So if we're giving a therapy, we'd look every week to see how that tumor responds every week. If we're looking at a genetic mutant and we want to see how loss of a gene affects the tumors, we'd probably look after every cycle of DSS and see how things progress. Probably, what other models do we do? Within the ones that can metastasize and things, we probably look every month because those tumors don't actually grow very fast. It takes a while for things to progress. For the ones that are getting confocal endoscopy, where we're looking at whether or not a therapy gets to the tumor, we probably look twice in one day to see, because a lot of drugs get cleared out by your liver and your bloodstream really quickly. Then we'd look probably once a week to see how long it stays. So it just depends on the, the question. It depends on the health of the mouse as well. If the mouse is clearly not healthy, we won't go into endoscopy, and that'll be the end point for that mouse. And if anybody wants to learn down the track, we'd love to teach people, because it is just Adele and I doing this for the whole institute. So if anybody has extra time and wants to learn new things, we like friends. <laughs>